this week we're talking about stocks and bonds, so let's start with the risks of investing. What you see here are seven different risks related to investing, and we'll go through each one. Um, there are business risks, financial risks, market risks, purchasing power, interest rate risk, liquidity risks, and event risks. So remember that risk is uncertainty, so we've got uncertainties in all these areas. Uncertainty about the type of business that we're investing in. Uncertainty about the financials related to that business. Uncertainty about the market in general and whether or not um, consumers are interested in the products and services that that firm provides. Uncertainty about purchasing power, so this is going to be related to inflation. Um, interest rate uncertainty, so that's going to have an impact on the return that we get from our investments and the borrowing rates that we and, and businesses see. And then liquidity, how quickly can we um, convert assets into cash, and then just risks related to specific negative events. Now the returns from investing come from different places. First there's current income. So on a bond, that would be interest coming from coupon payments. On a stock, it would be dividends. And on real estate, that would be rent. Capital gains just mean the increase in market value. So how much did that stock go up in value or change in value? Um, but if we're talking about capital gains, we're talking about increases. Um, how much did the bonds value increase and how much did the real estate's value increase? And then again, we like compound interest. So when we're talking about interest, we mean interest on interest, which comes from compounding. So now let's break down um, returns. Let's say that um, we've got either a 5% return or an 8% 8 re 8 return. And so what this graph is showing you is how much of that return comes from um, interest and how much of that return comes from interest on interest. And, and so if it's a $1,000 investment, you see first that um, recovery of principal, then the interest income, and then the compound interest income. So you see that um, the higher the interest rate, the better the return, and the fact that we earn compound interest instead of simple interest also has an impact on our total return. So we've talked about risk and we've talked about return. So putting them together gives us this concept of the risk and return trade-off. And what that means is that um, if you want to earn a greater return, you have to take on more risk. So in other words, the more risk, the more return. So that means the amount of risk that you take on is directly related to how much of a return you can expect to see on that investment. So illustrating that risk and return relationship, on this graph we have risk on one axis and return on the other. And we're plotting various um, investment choices and you can see that as the risk increases, the return increases. So treasury bills are the least risky, they're actually plotted at zero because they're considered risk free. And then we, as we take on more and more risk, going all the way out to precious metals, we have the potential for a greater and greater return. So then what makes a good investment? Now that we understand risk and return and how they're related, what things should we be looking for in order to capture that great return that investors want? Well, first of course, we're going to be considering what that future return might be. Um, and also the approximate yield, so that's relating to the current price as well. And then what return are we looking for? You know, some people will throw out 10%, 12%. What return are we looking for? And that can be our basis to figuring out if it's a good investment or not, given what, how that future return compares to what we're seeking. So here's a really nasty formula for approximate yield. Fortunately, we can do all of this in the, in the calculator. But what it's doing is it's taking that current income that we talked about, factoring in um, the change in the, the capital gain that we talked about, that change in value um, versus 
our initial investment over the entire investment horizon. And so that gives us a yield on the investment. So remember, we're talking about stocks and bonds. So let's start by going into detail on stocks. So what does it mean if you invest in common stock? Well, that means that you become an owner of the firm. So each share of stock represents part ownership in a company. And so that means that as an investor, you get to participate in the profits or, or take some ownership in the firm's process, profits. And so, um, but a key concept here is that that ownership is residual. And so what that means is that the firm has to pay their obligations first. And so the owners, the shareholders, have a residual claim on the firm, on the firm or on the firm's assets, meaning that if the firm were to liquidate, they'd have to pay off all their debts first, and then the shareholders get what's left. So that means shareholders want the total value of the firm to be as high as possible so that what's left, that residual, is as high as possible. So to give you some idea about um, what the returns on stocks are or how much fluctuation there are in stock values. Here's a graph of the NASDAQ, which is in blue, and the Dow Jones. Dow Jones are the 30 largest stocks. NASDAQ are mostly tech stocks. And you can see they, they pretty much move together um, over time. So this is showing you from early 2000s to about 2012 and um, how their value has changed. Now another key thing with respect to stock is that you have voting rights. So common shareholders usually get one vote for every share that they own. And typically if you only own a couple of shares, you'll just give someone else the right to vote on your behalf. So that, so that voting right is very important to large shareholders. Smaller shareholders tend not to be as concerned about it. But from a tax standpoint, um, shareholders need to know that the cash dividends that re they receive, that's their share of profits typically, and the long-term capital gains, that's the change in price of the stock, are both taxed at 15%. And so if you're in a lower tax, br tax bracket, it would be about 5%. And so those capital gains, though, are not taxed until they're realized. So to realize a capital gain, that would mean you'd have to sell the stock. Now, dividends are determined by the board of directors and they're usually paid quarterly. And in this country, a firm can even pay dividends if they show a loss. In other countries, that's not the way. But in this country, because um, some shareholders are so almost dependent on those dividends, that firms try really hard not to stop paying dividends to, so as not to disappoint those shareholders. So they're allowed to pay those dividends even if they're losing money. That's not something a firm could do forever, but if they think it's short term, they might go ahead and pay the dividend. So most companies pay cash dividends, but they could pay a stock dividend, which means that they'll just give you more stock as a way to um, share the profits with you. So one measurement that we like to calculate with respect to stock is the dividend yield. So that's the annual dividend divided by the price. 